I'm uh, Liz Stewart from the Department of Mental Health here at Johns Hopkins. I apologize for those of you in the front who can't see me. Um, I'm very happy to welcome you all uh, to this symposium, our Centennial Policy Scholar Symposium on Closing the Mental Health and Addiction Treatment Gap Through Policy. Um, we're having this day today in October. It's part of a, a yearly symposium series with Congressman Waxman. And we're having this day focused on mental health in October for two reasons. One is World Mental Health Day on October 10th. And also, because of that, October is the Department of Mental Health Centennial Month celebrating the centennial um, of the School of Public Health. So I want to say a few words first to thank some people who really helped put this day together. Uh, we have a series of events sort of associated with this noontime um, seminar. First is to Francis Henkel, uh, who has helped facilitate and support our Centennial um, Scholar Series, which I'll be saying more about in a minute. Um, but also, this event at Noon Now is co-sponsored by the Departments of Health Policy and Management, the Department of Mental Health, and our new Center on Mental Health and Addiction Policy Research, uh, which I'll say more about in a minute. Um, so I just want to give a thanks to the leadership of those departments, Ellen McKenzie and Danny Fallon, as well as to Josh, Josh Sharfstein, who was around, uh, for all of his help in putting the day together. Um, we've also had some wonderful administrative support from various uh, administrators from those departments. Um, I also want to take a minute, we're taking advantage of the events today to help uh, highlight and sort of advertise a new center that Colleen Berry and myself have um, are starting up. It's called the Center for Mental Health and Addiction Policy Research. Um, the aim of this new center here at the Bloomberg School is to improve the lives of persons with mental illness and addiction through engaging in policy research, translating research evidence into policy and practice, and training the next generation of mental health and addiction policy researchers. This new center is directed by myself and Colleen Berry, who you'll meet in a few minutes, um, with Beth McGinty and Ramin Mochtabai as deputy directors. And we have about 20 faculty from around the school who are associated as core faculty members. Uh, we're hoping to use the center to bring together people working in this area in events like we're having today. And I invite you to reach out to any of us. We also have a nice new website um, that you can look at for more information. So sort of stay tuned, and we hope that, that again, the center can provide a forum for these sorts of conversations. So it's now my great pleasure to introduce Congressman Henry Waxman. Uh, Congressman Waxman, as many of you know, is spending a year here at the school as our Centennial Scholar. One aspect of that are monthly symposia such as the one today on topics related to health policy. So today we'll be focusing on mental health and addiction treatment. There have been others uh, previously and, and looking forward there will be more, so look for those. Congressman Waxman is one of the most accomplished legislators in the history of the U.S. Congress. He represented California's 33rd district for 40 years, and his legislative achievements are vast, and I'm giving you just the 30 minute, 30 second, 30 minute, 30 minute. you don't really want to hear from him, do you? 30 second summary. Uh, so his achievements include the Ryan White Care Act, the Hatch-Waxman Act, establishing generic drugs, and oversight of the tobacco industry. Uh, he now serves as chairman at Waxman Strategies, a public affairs and strategic communications firm, um, advising clients on public policy. Uh, and as, in addition to being here at the school, he also has an affiliation at the University of California at Los, at Los Angeles. So again, I could go on for 30 minutes, uh, but I won't. I'll just uh, welcome him to give us an introduction to this policy area and our discussion today. Thank you. Thank you very much for that introduction. I'm delighted to be here with all of you at this forum. Uh, it's been a great honor for me to be the Centennial Scholar, as uh, not that I'm 100 years old, but the School <laughs> of Public Health is uh, the, the oldest school of public health in the country uh, is celebrating its 100th year. And this occasion today is the uh, initiation within the Bloomberg School of Public Health at Johns Hopkins of the uh, mental health and uh, substance abuse, I don't know if I'm saying it correctly, uh, division within the school itself. In fact, it deserves the correct statement. And uh, I'm going to find that for you. But this is the first event for 
uh, this new subdivision within the School of Public Health. And I thank uh, uh, Colleen for that uh, introduction, uh, Elizabeth Stewart for that introduction, and her work with Colleen Berry as co-chairs uh, of the Hopkins Center for Mental Health and Addiction Policy Research. This is a very important. When we look at the toll in this country that mental health and substance abuse and addiction causes us, it's a uh, it's a it's a, a a burden carried by the individuals, the families, and our whole economy and our whole society. A serious mental illness costs nearly two hundred billion dollars, not in treatment, but just in lost productivity. Suicide ranks among the uh, uh, the top killers, especially among young people. Addiction confers major negative externalities, such as uh, auto accidents and uh, communicable disease transmission and crime. The problems of uh, opiate and uh, heroin addiction has become a national epidemic. So people with mental illness and addiction problems have higher rates of not just those problems, but other chronic medical problems as well. Now, it's not that we don't have some treatments at work. The reality is that 40% only of people with mental illness have access to that treatment. And among those who have uh, addiction diagnosis, fewer than 10% get access to care. Uh, we've had an historical separation of what's called mental health and addiction services from mainstream medicine. The Congress passed the Mental Health Parity Act, trying to integrate health care itself, not to have this separation. It's historical, but it's also caused by insurance payers uh, who have treated the forms of illnesses differently. Uh, that uh, uh, parity bill is not fully realized its success. But with the Affordable Care Act, with the new models of health care delivery, with the ACOs and mental and the uh, health care homes, uh, we have a, a unique milestone, and especially with the Affordable Care Act, an opportunity to bring health care, not just for those who are now getting access through the individual market, for which most of the focus has been placed, but for the whole health care system to become far more integrated and better serve the patients. We've got two interesting panels this afternoon. I will be listening eagerly to uh, their wisdom. And I know as a policymaker, the research done by people here at Johns Hopkins School of Public Health and throughout the country, the practical experience of people who have dealt with these problems, either as individuals who have confronted them themselves or work within the system gives us an insight that we otherwise wouldn't have. And so uh, I'm delighted to be here with all of you and to introduce the, uh, uh, the conversation that we're going to have this afternoon. Thank you so much. Thank you to Congressman Waxman. I want to say what a tremendous um, opportunity it has been for us at Johns Hopkins on the faculty, our students, and our whole community to have Congressman Waxman with us this year as our Centennial Policy Scholar. I also just want to take a moment to um, to particularly thank two individuals who have been instrumental on the ground in making uh, this day happen, uh, Nick Enquist and Susan Morrow, who is over here. Thank you to both of you for all the tremendous work that you've done. Um, and thank you. And, and you should know that in addition to this public symposium, Susan and Nick have been uh, very involved in coordinating a whole series of events that we've had today, including um, this morning on campus, a closed-door research forum on mental health uh, and addiction parity, hosting about 35 uh, of the leading experts from both research and policy on this topic, as well as uh, this afternoon, a, a closed-door research forum on communication research 
and stigma, including another uh, large group of experts. And for those of you who have come to our campus to focus on issues of insurance and financing um, and stigma reduction in the context of policy, I thank you for taking time out of your schedule to be with us today. Um, and I welcome you to the Hopkins campus, hopefully many times, to work on these issues. Um, as many of you know, Director uh, Michael Botticelli, who runs the White House Office of National Drug Control Policy, was originally scheduled to provide introductory remarks for our symposium today and was pulled away due to an obligation last week to be uh, with the president uh, talking about issues related to addiction. And in his absence, I'm extraordinarily pleased uh, to say that Kate Fahrenholt has agreed uh, to, to step in and to provide some introductory rem remarks. I, I know that many of you know Kate. Um, she is the executive di director of the National Alliance on Mental Illness for the State of Maryland and has been actively involved in the work of NAMI Maryland since 1997, I think, when she was recruited to the board. Um, over the years, Kate has really been a lead advocate on issues affecting people with mental illness and their families, both in our state and uh, nationally. Kate has um, worked on a, a whole host of issues that are important to many of us, including homelessness, disparities, integration of primary and mental health care, emergency preparedness for individuals with disabilities, disabilities including mental illness, first responder training, um, issues facing um, uh, youth as they trend to transition to adulthood, mental illness and criminal justice, and many other issues. Kate has been recognized for her work um, on mental health disparities, disparities and efforts to increase minority inclusion in NAMI. She lives right here in Baltimore, where in addition to her many professional accomplishments, um, she has raised three adult sons and is the personal representative of her sister who's lived with schizophrenia for over 40 years. Please join me in welcoming Kate Farenholt. I am not Michael Botticelli. <laughs> so. Um, so having with that as the foundation, um, I am going to try to read fast. Uh, I am pretty good at talking policy from NAMI Maryland's perspective off the top of my head. But what I have to say here is a little bit more personal in many ways, so I have to have a script. Uh, I also would want to note uh, that uh, this my, the first week in October is also Mental Illness Awareness Week, so um, October is full. I'm Kate Farenholt. I'm the Executive Director of NAMI Maryland, uh, National Alliance on Mental Illness of Maryland. I found my voice and my calling when I first started volunteering at a local NAMI 20 years ago, at least 20 years ago. I shared a little bit about my family's journey with my sister as she battled with paranoid schizophrenia starting in her early teens. I had never really shared in public in any way, and it was really, really hard. But what strength I got back from the friendly NAMI audience. So here I am still. Stories are as old as human communication, and there's a power in stories, which someone recently told me is now called the personal narrative. So I might note that my father, I am no way a scientist or a researcher, my father who was um, a, a scientist and a researcher and a diplomat, um, used to say that sometimes science catches up to common sense. Not me, that was my father. Okay. Um, and he did go to Hopkins, by the way. Uh, <clears throat> Narratives are increasingly available as sources of health information for patients and the public and for clinical, behavioral, and social science researchers who are touting the unique capabilities of stories to enhance understanding, model desirable behaviors, deliver support, and deal with complex decisions and emotions. But personal stories have been the unframed, unspoken core, uh, at least in my view, to the NAMI philosophy from the beginning. Having mental illness happen to you or in your family is a trauma in itself, for the individual, certainly, and also for the family. 
And being stigmatized only compounds the trauma. Stories can change paradigms, confront myths and stigma, and help us counter the isolation that comes to individuals and families dealing with mental illness. I tell people, we are the experts. Our direct experience matters, and we need to share it. Storytelling for a purpose is powerfully engaging for the listener, whether another individual or a group, or on the web. But it is also extremely empowering and transforming for the narrator once they're off the stage. <laughs> Got lots of little notes here. Presenters tell us consistently that it is extremely transformative knowing that people thought what they had to share was important, that they were experts on living with mental illness and had something worth saying that others could learn from. And continued telling stories to different audiences kept them centered and reminded them what they needed for recovery. Knowing that your story, your example, can help someone else is extremely valuable. It is also extremely relevant to engaging people in treatment and ongoing support. We help individuals with mental illness, and now we're working a lot with substance use um, organizations. We help people, individuals with mental illness, and their family members tell their stories in peer education courses and support groups, and we empower each other. And then we train, intensively train, many of them to tell their stories safely and effectively to a variety of audiences, from police to behavioral health staff to any number to decision makers. And I won't list all the programs that we do that do that. We help transform trauma into positive action. So let me tell you part of my story. Mental illness struck my family 45 years ago. As I said, I'm not <coughs> Mike Pirelli, but um, um, I do have substance use in my extended family, but that's not what I'm going to talk about. At 13, my sister was a sweet, funny, and very talented girl. She was an above average student with great musical talent. She played the violin and piano and easily learned other instruments in a sitting or two, much to my non-musical disgust. <laughs> I came from a family full of musicians. <clears throat> she was athletic, and she was open to adventure. She ran easily off the high dive while people backed up behind me. I was shy, and I often chose not to try things for fear of embarrassment or failure. Now my sister was terrified by grotesque nightmares, sorry, paranoid delusions, and stray thoughts from out of nowhere. My father and mother were desperate to help her in any way they could. And that was 40, more than 45 years ago. That was back when families were still routinely blamed for the severe brain disorders of their family members. Brain research was in its infancy. My sister was first hospitalized two years Later, when she was 15 and I was 17, at one of the last bastions of mental health treatment which touted the schizophrenogenic mother. The dominant, overprotective, but basically rejecting mother who causes schizophrenia in their child. I'll talk about things that have changed. But even then, it was assumed, and quite frankly stated to me in public on a stage like this, when we first, after two months of not seeing my sister so they could remake her personality, they invited the family come, to come see my sister. We did not realize we were walking out onto a stage. Very similar to this, where we were over there and my sister and the treating doctor was here, and there was an audience of students and, and professionals. This is a, was a quite traumatic experience. <laughs> I can't even imagine for my sister. It was especially traumatic for me because I, about halfway through, after someone asked me if I had been sexually abused by my father, um, 
and a few other questions, like why was I going away from New York City to Minnesota for college? And I could have said, well, you know, I wanted to get away from my family, but I couldn't really say that because that would be normal in any other family, but in my family on the stage, it wasn't a good thing. But I looked out into my into the audience, and right smack dab in the middle was a fellow student from my high school whose father apparently was a, a psychiatrist at the institution. Um, so you can imagine how these things can really impact how you view um, interactions, future interactions with, with you and your family, um, even well-intentioned reactions. Um, sorry about that. That was a little bit tight. And to the side, unlike with other brain disorders, like Alzheimer's or Parkinson's, none of us were given more than a minimal education about my sister's illness, her prognosis, or coping skills, even though this was to be a long-term chronic illness, and the family was the primary caregiver. From the time my sister first became ill, my parents desperately sought treatment at whatever cost, emotionally or otherwise. My parents remortgaged their home, then sold it. Um, I certainly went on to scholarship. Uh, they moved into an apartment in another state, Maryland. Well, actually, two, three other states, but ended up in Maryland, where mental health services were somewhat better. They depleted their savings for retirement and for our education along the way. They were very lucky. My father was a scientist and diplomat. He had a higher medical insurance coverage that covered psychiatric treatment and hospitalization up to a point. And the lifetime cap did not run out as fast as most. But it ran out quickly. In addition to the financial strains, my family had to focus its energies on my sister's roller coaster of crisis, relapse, disappearance, periodic hospitalization, and finding treatment that never seemed adequate. We, we siblings strove to be perfect, or to distance ourselves, or to act, or we acted out to get attention. My sister has always been extremely close to our family. She calls me daily and depends on me to, quote, protect her. Unfortunately, one of her first signs of relapse is to become paranoid about those family members that she counts on. My sister used to, I'm sorry, I do love mental health. I mean, I love these acronyms and, 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 and these really nice descriptive words, but I really do not like this word. I don't know if you still use it. My sister used to elope. Um, when she was scared by her voices. Um, they told her that people, including her family, were trying to poison her. We were aliens who had taken over the bodies of her real family, etc. And when I was in college, my sister disappeared from the private hospital in the Baltimore area, which will remain unnamed, um, where she was staying. She was missing for a very long time. It turned out that she was in and out of hospitals in California while my family was frantically looking for her. Providers apparently assumed that there was no interested family and didn't check the missing persons um, list. Um, in addition, my sister's delusions made her believe that she had actually killed her family. And when asked, if she was asked, therefore, information about her family, she would say we were all dead. But as I said at our conference just a couple of days ago in front of a bunch of police officers and criminal justice officials, I said, it was a community police officer who took the time to sit down and connect with her, who, and a very disoriented and quite frankly um, garbled discussion and asked where she'd grown up and got the name of the small town in New Jersey and called the police chief and asked, does anybody, are there any people in the town who might know a relative who still is living, who might be able to connect with this girl? Of course, my parents were on a plane um, the next day. Um, NAMI has helped my family cope with individual crises, negotiate the system, and learn about the brain, new psych medications, treatments, and coping skills. My sister has survived, and I have been able to lead my own life, to marry, and have children. Eventually, I temporarily volunteered at NAMI, and I have met and learned from innumerable brave individuals and family members and those who help, uh, attempt to help them. 
The power of personal experience can be transformative, and I might add, peers can be the most effective means to reach others who are overwhelmed and isolated by an illness and the issues surrounding it. Especially such an, ish, an illness that holds such so, social stigma. We become fragile and easily hurt by presumably unintentional acts and words by those who are there to help us. I cannot tell you how many times a neighbor, a treatment provider, a relative, says something that takes my breath away. And I check in with others to get my balance again. My sister is living in a 24-hour supervised home. She has not been moved in the last year. Um, and I believe it is primarily because I am the executive director of NAMI Maryland. Um, because quite frankly, it is, it is much easier to move people to their level of care rather than bring it to them. So um, there, is, there are improvements. We're, we're moving forward. But even in my privileged role, I unfortunately accept what we can get. As long as my sister has a roof over her head, she has meds and food, and she's safe. Her physical health is not really the focus, but I believe that's changing. Thank you. Um, over the last 20 years, as I said, I have met with and learned from so many individuals with mental illness who are in re recovery and their families and providers. So really quickly, and I know I'm running late, what has changed and what needs to change? I'm not going to read all of this, but just to give you some highlights, um, obviously medications, they just, they didn't, there wasn't medications really when my sister started. Um, a focus on recovery, what it really takes. Now, focus on recovery is great, but focusing on what it really takes in terms of supportive services and benefits, effective outreach and engagement, crisis services, the full continuum of services is really, um, uh, there is more focus. Um, it also needs to be addressed. The value of peers has, has really increased. Um, we're trauma-informed, which quite frankly, or we try to be trauma-informed, which quite frankly from a family perspective has a double-edged sword because I can't tell you how many people who have been trained to be trauma-informed have started the conversation with me about something I was asked on this stage, a stage, 45 years ago, where you or your sister sexually abused by your father. And I can't tell you that that is a, not a good way to start a good conversation. Um, but it's also, I mean, there might have been other dysfunctions in my family, but that was not one of them. Um, early detection and prevention, big focus on that. Um, we are always concerned, though that is one of our very high priorities, we're always concerned that we are also looking at the, <laughs> the front end and also this other end, the people who are not getting treatment, the people who might refuse treatment, the people who need the intensive services, um, hopefully to get them back into the community. Um, health insurance expansion has made quite a bit of difference. Uh, my mother was on a bus to, D to uh, Minneapolis however many years ago it was that Maryland passed its first parity legislation. Um, and now we have federal parity legislation. And now, and we've got a whole lot of work to do to really make it the next step. Integration of substance use and mental health and a physical and behavioral health. Um, how to take the best of both of all these different worlds and combine them, treat the whole person, but not lose focus on the people, um, we're always concerned that people like my sister, while she, while she hopefully will get more attention to her physical help, health, will be in a setting where she is receptive to that. Um, on and on, I could keep going. Um, the effects that there's been a lot of changes and a lot of really good things. You hear all the time, though, how many people are either being treated or not treated in the criminal justice system, in homeless shelters, um, have interrupted school and employment. Uh, and a lot of this is because we're not providing sufficient behavioral health services. 
Um, and a lot of that, we believe, I believe, is um, because of a whole lot of different kinds of stigma. There is institutional and social stigma. There is, um, which, which also prevents people from, if you have, if you get your first or second call to the police, when your family has to call the police because that's what they're told to do, to get an emergency petition or evaluation, and you have an, a bad interaction either as a family or as a consumer, you know, you're less likely to access that service or any service. There are a lot of different kinds of things that the, the interactions can make a big difference. But also the fact is that our society is, uh, this is, these are stigmatized issues and our society does not consider them to be sufficiently important. As a matter of fact, they're sort of almost the opposite. Um, that we have not as a society committed to owning and addressing the issue, even though we're all affected. I mean, everyone out there is affected. So um, I would say the, la the last two things are that we've come a long way. Um, we now, the st statistics show that the general public believes that mental illnesses are brain disorders. But in the same breath, <laughs> they don't want to have anything to do with someone with a mental illness or substance use issue. And finally, I would say that um, family blaming is still hugely in both substance use and mental illness. And it may be more subtle, but I still hear the words manipulative and enabling. I still, though my si sister signs her releases all the time, they get buried in the file, and I am never called when she disappears or when she goes to the hospital. I get a fall call. She borrows money for the pay phone to call me and say, why haven't you come to see me while I'm looking for her? So there's a lot to be done. There's a lot, a lot of great hope. And there's been huge improvements over 45 years. Um, I hope that you will all work to research, um, contribute to the research that will actually get us to the next step. Thank you very much. for being willing to talk about your story and also share your expertise. Um, I'm pleased to now uh, invite Richard Frank. Um, he's the first of our three panel speakers. Richard is currently in the administration of President Barack Obama as the Assistant Secretary for Planning and Evaluation at the Department of Health and Human Services. In this position, Richard advises the Secretary uh, of the Department on Development of Health disability, uh, human services, and science policy, and provides advice uh, and analysis on economic policy. Um, Richard is on leave from his position as the Margaret T. Morris Professor of Health Economics in the Department of Health Care Policy at Harvard Medical School. From 2009 to 2011, uh, he served before um, uh, at ASPE as the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Planning and Evaluation, directing the Office of Disability Aging and Long-Term care policy. Uh, his research uh, has made uh, foundational contributions to our field in the area of e economics uh, of mental health and substance use uh, disorder care, long-term um, care financing and disability policy. Prior to Harvard, uh, Richard held faculty positions here at our Bloomberg School in the Department of Health Policy and Management. And at Pitt, he is the recipient of too many awards for me to list, but I'll name just one or two. The Distinguished uh, uh, Service Award from the Mental Health Association of Maryland uh, and the Carl Taub Award for Outstanding Contributions in Mental Health Services Research from the American Public Health Association. Um, this isn't part of his bio, but I'll say that Richard has been uh, a wonderful um, mentor to me, a research mentor for the last 15 years. And please join me in welcoming Richard to the podium. Um, as Colleen mentioned, uh, I'm an economist, and therefore, um, 
I don't have the social skills to share um, a personal narrative with you, um, and as Kate so wonderfully did. Uh, I am really pleased to be here, and, and, and it is a, uh, a bit of a homecoming for me. And if the old adage is true that you are reflected uh, by the company you keep, I'm also honored to be here. Um, uh, I was told, and I want to emphasize the word told by Colleen, uh, <laughs> that I am to speak uh, about closing the mental health and addiction treatment gap through policy, and in my case, federal policy. Uh, I've learned that I do what Colleen tells me to do. <laughs> so in my time with you today, um, I want to start off by saying, uh, th saying something about what we think the coverage gap means. Uh, I'll then outline some of the uh, classes of action that we have taken in the last six years uh, uh, to address it. Uh, and then I want to focus a little bit on one dimension of closing the gap, and that is uh, consumer or patient engagement. Um, for me, the coverage gap involves several dimensions. Uh, first, uh, people in need of behavioral uh, health care uh, getting care. So do they get care? Second, are they getting that care at the right time? And then third, are they getting something that can be expected to work and work for them? Now, the way the, this administration thinks about closing those gaps or that gap uh, is by removing barriers to getting into treatment, expanding the capacity to supply evidence-based treatment, and through accountability and measurement, uh, including uh, um, uh, paying for value uh, as one dimension of that. Um, we've moved on all three fronts, and let me just start with parity. I guess that is the theme of the day. Uh, so interim final uh, regulations and final regulations were issued in uh, 2010 and late two 2013, respectively, and they pertained uh, to large employers or, or, or large group coverage uh, arrangements. Uh, the Act extended, uh, the, uh, rather the Affordable Care Act, uh, extended the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act to individual uh, coverage and small group coverage. Uh, these provisions became effective with the final regulations for the benefit years starting in July of 2014. Uh, this therefore means we're in the uh, uh, middle of the first full year of implementation uh, of those regulations. Now, the evidence on adherence shows that employers have been quite good uh, for uh, adhering to the benefit design provisions of the uh, parity statute, uh, but the results have been more mixed on uh, the so-called non-quantitative treatment limits or how do you manage care provisions uh, of the Act. Um, we're currently in the field uh, uh, examining uh, adherence to parity in the small group and individual markets. Uh, these developments <coughs> are translating into utilization responses that, uh, at least from uh, survey data uh, and claims data, suggest that actually there is already uh, uh, measurable responses. For example, rates of treatment for mental disorders have never been higher. Okay. So, uh, uh, you know, we have a long way to go, and you know, as some people say, better but not well. Um, but uh, we are right now at a period where the rates of treatment and the rates of treatment for people who need treatment have never been higher in U.S. history. You know, that's an accomplishment. Uh, second, treatment of children and youth for mental disorders have grown substantially, especially since uh, the Affordable Care Act's uh, provisions that allowed uh, coverage for, uh, for uh, young adults under the age of, up to the age of 26 on their parents' policies. Um, uh, we've seen uh, both growth of inpatient and outpatient services uh, in connection to that. And finally, uh, uh, unfortunately, we have not yet seen uh, those types of responses on the substance use disorder treatment side. Now, um, we've also um, issued a notice of proposed rulemaking to address parity in the Medicaid managed care 
uh, world. And uh, the comments that come in, those are being reviewed, and there'll be sort of final rules uh, forthcoming. Now, one interesting thing to reflect on here is that when the um, parity legislation was passed, nobody expected the management of care to be touched on, right? Not the parity implementation coalition, not the industry, especially not the industry, uh, and not most of the members of Congress who were involved in the legislation. Um, some of them, yes, but not all of them. So actually, the fact that that has become the focal point for policy discussions around parity is uh, sort of, again, an important event. Because it's, uh, for the most part, I think people are assuming that we've gotten most of the way there on the benefit design provisions. Uh, let me now uh, turn to expanding capacity. This involves new payment arrangements for community behavioral health centers, uh, directing new money to expand substance use disorder treatment uh, in a targeted, evidence-based fashion, uh, and creating new opportunities in the Medicaid program to, uh, to expand treatment capacity and evidence-based treatment programs. Um, we've, expand, uh, <coughs> we've issued proposed regulations that relax some of the restrictions on institutions of mental disease through the managed care rules under Medicaid. Uh, we've also created waiver opportunities for relaxing restrictions on institutions for mental disease for substance use treatment in the context of building up a community-based treatment system. The Affordable Care Act uh, added the 1915-I state option in Medicaid that allows for greater flexibility in programming for people with serious mental illnesses. And the ACA also created Medicaid health homes, as Congressman Waxman uh, noted, that are specifically focused on severe and persistent mental illnesses. Uh, and then uh, the recent, well, the first version of the uh, doc fix legislation established a demonstration program for community behavioral health centers and planning grants were just announced uh, yesterday. And these are awards that are going to the state that will result in increased payment levels to community behavioral health centers, uh, tying payment to quality, and uh, rewards for efficiency and cost containment. Um, on the addiction side, we recently put out a grant program that would direct $100 million to federally qualified health centers to um, expand uh, the use of medication-assisted treatment, uh, or MAT, for the treatment of uh, substance use disorders, in particular, opioid use disorder. Uh, finally, Secretary Burwell recently announced a rulemaking effort to expand treatment, uh, medication-assisted treatment that involves the drug buprenorphine. Um, let me now turn to the engagement issue. You're all probably, you've probably noticed uh, that there is the appearance of a great deal of disagreement about where we should be taking mental health policy, especially when it comes to people with serious mental illnesses. Um, I'd like to argue uh, that there is actually a basic common thread uh, that uh, goes through the entire policy uh, discussion here and that there is uh, a fair amount of common ground in the ideas that are being advanced. That is, how do we better engage people with serious mental illnesses? I think that is, a, is at the heart of this debate, and I think there is agreement across the board that we must do better to engage uh, these populations and these populations earlier. And I think there's a huge amount of common ground there to build on. All parties are uniformly supportive of new efforts uh, that aim at early interventions for people with serious mental illnesses or for people at risk for serious mental illnesses. Uh, the challenge is that we know that the duration of untreated psychosis is strongly negatively related to outcomes and positively related to ongoing disability. Uh, and through a variety of small trials and the NIMH RAISE project, uh, we have an idea of what some of the most promising treatments look like. Uh, nevertheless, we're searching for better ways to engage people. Uh, 
NIMH, right? Uh, the flagship raise program still is engaging people after more than a year. Okay? And this is like the largest effort we've ever undertaken to engage people early. And almost nobody believes that that's a satisfactory duration uh, of time. And so um, uh, what we're doing is we're going to uh, provide uh, enough flexibility in sort of the way we fund programs so that we can learn as much as possible uh, what works in terms of engaging people er early. And uh, I'll come back to that in a moment, but you see states doing things differently. And we think there are tremendous opportunities there to learn. Uh, there's also broad support uh, for this effort that's reflected in uh, sort of support for uh, uh, expansion of state block grants um, to uh, implement uh, models that reflect the learning from the RAISE program. And it's uh, there that we're going to introduce the flexibility so that we can allow states to figure out the best way to reach people to engage them and then to bring them to those most promising models or bring those most promising models to them. Um, the Congress and the administration have also uh, shown great support for these ideas for the uh, prospects of engaging people earlier uh, by large appropriations directed at Social Security uh, for mounting a demonstration uh, that will, again, use those same concepts to engage people at risk of going out to Social Security disability insurance. And so, again, um, uh, we've shifted our attention away from trying to do something at the back end, and we're trying to engage people early, trying to get them uh, um, the support they need to uh, stay in the mainstream of society as long as possible. Now, the disagreements are focused on other approaches that you might take to engaging stakeholders. Uh, and again, there are a lot of ideas and there's um, um, uh, some disagreement in them. Let me tell you what we believe. Uh, we believe that there's a lot of room for agreement here that can result in, there's enough room for agreement that can result in important and meaningful changes that will make uh, people with serious mental illness much better off in the future than they are today. Um, and uh, make it much more probable that somebody will get something that works and works for them at an earlier point in time. Now in the coming weeks, um, we will be announcing some additional initiatives uh, that promote greater consumer engagement, uh, including uh, promotion of com uh, um, uh, peer supports uh, that focus on uh, retaining consumers in treatment. Um, we are um, going to be announcing measures that promote accountability through measurement and, in particular, measuring consumers' experiences uh, with behavioral health services. So I will stop there, but I just want to note that uh, there's clearly much to be done. Uh, we have a, a long way to go, uh, but we plan to be doing much in the coming months. Thanks. Thank you, Richard. Our next speaker is Hank Stedman, um, and uh, Hank is the founding president of Policy Research Associates. Prior to this, Hank ran, ran the research bureau for the New York State Mental Health uh, Office of Mental Health for almost two decades. Um, at Policy Research Associates, his current projects included running the SAMHSA Gain Center for Behavioral Health and Justice Transformation, um, the Service Members, Veterans and Their Families Technical Assistance Center. Um, he has um, likewise numerous uh, awards and accomplishments. Um, very briefly, this Distinguished Service Award from the American Sociological Association, um, the Distinguished Service Award from NAMI, uh, and like Richard, Hank uh, received the Carl Taub Award um, for contributions in mental health from the um, American Public Health Association. I want to um, just say that I think there's no one in the country more no knowledgeable about the intersection of uh, the criminal justice system and health reform and implications for individuals with uh, mental illness and substance use disorders. Please join me in welcoming Hank.
Thank you. My job today is to talk about the criminal justice system in the context of parity, substance use disorders, and mental health. And my uh, focus is going to be heavily on the jail. And I want to do that for a couple of reasons. And just for those of you that don't come from the criminal justice, jails are county-operated facilities where people initially come to and typically serve sentences less than one year, although now it's up to three years in many jurisdictions. Prisons are state-operated, long-term places for people convicted of felonies. <clears throat> Why are jails important? Well, today, the Bureau of Justice Statistics says that there are about 7 million people under correctional supervision. And you know where 5 million of them are? In the community. There's about 750,000 in the jail and 1.25 million in prisons. So you say, okay, the jail's smallest of those three groups. What are jails? In the social work, there's a term people processing versus people changing organizations. Jails are people processing. 12 million people a year are booked at the U.S. jails. Today, there's 750,000 in them, but 12 million are booked in. So, okay, how's that relevant to mental health and substance use disorders? Well, the best statistics out there from a study that uh, I was involved in that had two jails in Maryland and three in New York came up with a prevalence rate of persons being booked into the jails who had current symptoms of serious mental illness sufficient that they would be similar to people in acute psychiatric inpatient units, 17%. About 14.5% of the men and 31% of the women. That means that there's about 2 million people a year, and it's a duplicated count, so it's 2 million bookings, into U.S. jails that come into the jail with current active symptoms of serious mental illness. I think the jail is terribly important just for the volume question. And a term I heard, I think it was in the early 70s, a psychologist at the University of Alabama, Stan Brodsky, and he called the jail a public health outpost. And I think it's a wonderful concept of how much could, good could happen in the jail. The second thing is, where does the jail sit in the criminal justice system? Well, one of the models that we've developed for strategic planning in communities is called the sequential intercept model. And it just takes us, it's a schematic of the criminal justice system that breaks it down into five intercept points where persons coming through the system who have serious mental illness could be intercepted and prevented from penetrating the system. So that you've got law enforcement at the outset, dispatch and law enforcement. Then you've got initial booking, where you have arraignment. Then you have the jails, mental health courts, dispositional courts. Then you have jails and prisons where people are going to be discharged back to the community. And then you have intercept five, which is community corrections. So you've got these five intercepts. Where's the jail? It's right in the middle at intercept three. So on the one hand, you've got this high volume. You've got a lot of opportunity here as a public health outpost. But at the same time, let's think about these issues of treatment parity upstream too. Because ideally, you'd like to keep people out of the jail. So what do you do with law enforcement? What do you do with initial arraignment and detention, as well as what do you do with reentry? And parity, I don't think, is nearly as important to justice-involved individuals as it is for the rest of the world. Because for the most part, these folks on their medical surgical benefits historically have had zero. So zero parity is going to be great. They'll still have zero. The issue really is the Affordable Care Act and the initial opportunity for enrollment. And there was a great issue of health affairs uh, in March of 2014 that had some interesting numbers. And I don't want to overwhelm you with numbers. But they estimated that in the expansion states <coughs> that 25 to 30 percent of jail releasees would be eligible under ACA. <clears throat> they estimated in non-expansion states that 20% of the people in the marketplace would be eligible. So we got a big chunk of people. Um, the state of Washington had some data in that, that there would be 160,000 folks coming out of jails and prisons in the state of Washington that would be eligible, only 20% of whom pre-ACA would have been eligible. 
th another number in there that I thought was really a powerful one, that we heard the number 13 million folks were going to become eligible under ACA. The estimate was a quarter of them were just as involved. So this is a really important place to look at getting people enrolled. And that's, that's the next, next point I would make. <laughs> For the folks we're talking about that are involved in the criminal justice system, eligibility is great. Eligibility without enrollment is useless. And I think what we really need to think about in this context is how do we develop enrollment procedures that in fact get all of these people who could become eligible, poor, heavily persons of color, people who have not had health services, let alone mental health and substance use services, how can we get them enrolled? And the jail is a great starting point because the coming into the jail is a focal point. I think you have one of the nationally renowned programs that nobody ever talks about in Montgomery County, Maryland. They look great. Rob Green, the, the, uh, the jail administrator, has done a fabulous job for a number of years pre-ACA. I think, uh, I know uh, uh, Hayden and her, her uh, Beth and some of the other uh, researchers here have a project going on Cook County, which is Chicago, Illinois, that has made a huge investment in getting lots of people enrolled. The state of Oregon, uh, Multnomah County, uh, uh, Portland, has done a great job of getting programs up of enrolling people. So I think that's, those are really important issues to think about. But I'd also like people thinking about what do we do and intercepts one and two. If we're trying to, I've always said, in terms of dealing with justice-involved people with behavioral health disorders, American communities need to do three things. They need to keep people out of the jail who don't need to be there. They need to provide constitutionally adequate services when they're incarcerated because, interestingly enough, the only U.S. citizens that have a constitutional right to treatment are incarcerated individuals. <laughs> it's true. There's tort liability. You can get sued <laughs> if you don't. And thirdly, at the back door of the jail, you need to link people to comprehensive and community appropriate services to keep them from coming back. Those are the three things you're trying to do. So when we think about eligibility and enrollment, the jail as a public health outpost is a really important place to think about. But when we're developing alternative programs where we're trying to work with crisis intervention teams and law enforcement, and we say, <clears throat> instead of bringing them to the jail to book them, develop some sort of crisis center that they can bring them to. Well, what are we going to do with the crisis center in terms of enrollment? So I think that, and then likewise, I don't hear anybody talking about probation as a place to think about enrolling people. Well, one of the things that we've seen in this country in the last, I don't know, six to eight years is in other communities who are trying to keep people out of the jail, that first two intercepts, they recognize that a primary front door of the jail is probation, which is intercept five, because people with serious mental illness are much more likely to violate a technical violation that they don't live where they're supposed to, they start using again, uh, they're hanging out with people they're not supposed to, and they don't commit a new crime, but they technically violate and they go back to jail. So that in fact, it's a great opportunity to get the people that we didn't get, we didn't divert them, they didn't get enrolled in the jail, and here we have them in probation. I don't see anybody setting up probation, and as I said, five million people of the seven million under correctional supervision are in the community. So I think that's a great focal point. <clears throat> The last set of issues that I like to talk about is how this group of people relates to the essential health benefit packages. Because the people we're talking about, I always, the metaphor I've come up with is the trifecta. They have serious mental illness. 75 to 80 percent have co occurring substance use disorder, and the vast majority have histories of physical and sexual abuse. But there was a SAMHSA study that we were evaluators of, about 2,200 people post-booking diversion. And we asked everyone at the baseline interview if they had a lifetime history of physical and sexual abuse. The women, 92%. No surprise. The men, 88%. Now, with the women, it was heavily sexual abuse. With the men, it was heavily physical abuse. You basically need universal precautions for people that are justice involved because if they've got serious mental illness, they almost all have co-occurring substance use disorders and they all, for all intents and purposes, have trauma histories. So what are in the essential health benefit packages? Well, one of the real issues is the IMD exclusion. 
because one of the things that is important that the research shows, if you want to engage, as Richard was talking about, not only enroll <laughs> and, and get them enrolled in a program, they're entitled, they're enrolled, engaged is <laughs> one of the things that the people were talking about, uh, a label that gets hung on them is that they're, <laughs> that you're, they're treatment resistant clients. And that's why they keep recycling. Well, I would argue that if you look at the services, it's not treatment resistant clients, it's client resistant services. <laughs> and that's what the issue is. And when you look, so what are the essential health benefits that are being put in the packages that they're entitled to and enrolled in? And the, um, um, one of the issues is that if you have a, we know statistics from research, if you want people to show up for their appointments after they leave the jail, in reach into the jail by community-based providers so they see who the person is, they'll show up for their appointment. Well, in most jurisdictions, that's not a reimbursable service if the case manager comes into the jail. There are states that, in fact, have set it up so that it is seen as a community service, not an IMD service. So you've got to do that. Um, the evidence-based practice for persons with co-occurring substance use disorder is integrated dual disorder treatment. Is that considered an SUD services? Is it considered a mental health service? Well, what is it? Well, it depends how your state Medicaid office has defined that, and is that going to be part of the essential health benefit package? And if you're going to, if it's going to be effective for these folks, then I think that um, you've got to consider in the trauma services. What sort of trauma specific, not trauma informed, I mean we want to be trauma informed to do the right things, but you need trauma specific clinical interventions that some of which have a very modest database. Uh, they're promising practices really, they're not really evidence based practices yet, but are they going to be reimbursable? And if they're not, then you're not likely to be terribly successful with the services you're trying to get these people enrolled in. And my time basically up? Okay. <laughs> I, I think that is a strong hint. So <laughs> I have some other materials here in terms of what research I'd like to have done, but uh, research is important, but I was putting together a presentation on some of these issues, and I went back to a, f a flyer that I had. It was from the National Coalition for Jail Reform. It's undated. My best guess, it's about 1985, 30 years ago, and the major issue there was people aren't getting the right services, and they're ending up in the jail. We've known this. It's not new. And the services, what the services are that people need, we know how to do almost all this stuff. We just haven't done it. And I think seeing the jail as a public health outpost and, and, and recognizing who these folks are and what they need is this great opportunity. And the ACA is a heck of an opportunity if people grab it for this population. Thank you. Thank you, Hank. That was great. Um, our last speaker is Steve Sharstein. And what I'm going to ask you guys to do, um, when Steve's done, we're going to ask the panel to come up. We're going to have a couple minutes, minutes for questions um, from the audience, if I can keep folks on time. Um, and uh, <laughs> then, uh, and there are um, microphones here. So when the panel comes up, if you have a question, go to the microphones, and we'll try to get to a couple. Um, Steve served as pre has served as president and chief executive officer. Officer of Shepherd Pratt Health System here down the road in Baltimore for nearly 30 years, 29 and a half, something like that. Uh, Steve's a clinical professor and vice chair of psychiatry at University of Maryland, a practicing clinician for more than 35 years. Steve is well known um, for his research and writings on economic and practice of public mental health. I have read some of these articles from the 70s and the 80s. Um, over 13 years, he held various different positions at the National Institute of Mental Health, including Director of Mental Health Service Programs. Uh, he was uh, Secretary, Vice President, and most recently President of the American Psychiatric Association in 2005 and 2006. He is the recipient of many, many awards, 2007 recipient of the Human Rights Award from the American Psychiatric Association. Steve is uniquely able to think about these policy issues from the front lines of organizing, providing cares, care to individuals in particular those with serious mental illness, and from the perspective of his long and distinguished history in this field, please join me in welcoming Steve Sharks. Uh, 
Uh, thank you, Colleen, and congratulations on the, the new mental health policy uh, effort here at the Bloomberg School of Public Health. Uh, thank you for not introducing me as Josh's dad. I appreciate that. <laughs> Uh, this is the way I've been introduced uh, uh, lately in Maryland, all over the state. <laughs> right. um, I, um, uh, I'm going to take you back a bit um, with Congressman Waxman sitting here. Uh, at one time, uh, when I was actually a little younger than Josh, I was in charge of the Community Mental Health Centers program for the NIMH. And uh, in that role, uh, I ended up uh, working closely with uh, Mrs. Carter, Rosalind Carter, uh, on her commission, and then in drafting the Mental Health Systems Act of 1980. Um, part of that was an oversight hearing that Congressman Waxman chaired for the Subcommittee on Health and the Environment um, called the Community Mental Health Center's Oversight Committee. Uh, and I was the only witness, and they were reviewing the history of the Community Mental Health Center's program. Uh, and after uh, some friendly questions from Congressman Waxman and a few others. Another member of the committee uh, was a, uh, a gentleman by the name of William Dannemeyer, who I'm sure you will remember. And so um, it came time for him to ask me questions, and I, you have to understand how this works. The panel sits up high. The witness sits down low. <laughs> and I was alone, and then in back of me was a group just like about this size, all of whom were part of the advocacy coalition trying to get mental health reform and trying to get this bill passed. So, Mr. Dannemeyer, you are a psychiatrist, are you not? I'm thinking to myself, uh-oh. <laughs> My response was yes. Mr. Dannemeyer, how would you assess a Congress which year after year exhibits an, an addition to spending more money than it takes, oh, no, wait a minute, right. I forgot, I forgot. Mr. Dannemeyer, is it not one of the elements of mental illness, the failure of a person to be in touch with reality? <laughs> My response was yes. How would you assess a Congress which year after year exhibits uh, an addiction to spending more money than it takes in, in the way of taxes? How would you describe that in the terms of your perspective as a psychiatrist and in terms of mental illness? So I'm sitting there and I say, this is my chance to make the front page of the Washington Post. <laughs> Shrink calls Congress bonkers. <laughs> Instead, I said, uh, I pray this exceeds my competence. I'm only competent to diagnose patients uh, and uh, treat uh, symptoms and, of, of, of mental illness, something of that sort, kind of babbling along. And everybody in, in, in the back of me started to boo, boo. <laughs> So, so Josh was 10 years old, and uh, I would come home and I would talk about Congressman Waxman. And he was a hero in our house. He was a hero on the, on the in terms of the level of Carl Yastrzemski of the Red Sox. <laughs> you know, Cal Ripken. I mean, he was, and so it was no accident that when he had a chance to go work for Congressman Waxman, he was working for somebody that he had heard about uh, as a very young, impressionable uh, person. Uh, I want to tell you a little bit about Shepard Pratt, the real world of Shepard Pratt, and how it's changed over 30 years. Um, it, it's mostly a good story, but we have uh, many obstacles to, that we need to overcome to truly be responsive to the needs of uh, individuals and families in the community, to be able to take care of uh, Kate Farenthold's sister and her family in a way that's much better than uh, 30 years ago. When I got to Shepherd Pratt um, in 1986, it was a very esteemed long-term private hospital, inpatient care. Our average stay was 80 days, and for children and adolescents it was 125 days. Shepherd was unique in the country in that it sponsored a community mental health center in Baltimore County. We're the only private psychiatric hospital, and as you know, we're not-for-profit, and we have a Quaker heritage that sponsored a comprehensive community mental health center uh, in Baltimore County. It was a way of our Quaker board in terms of giving back. And it attracted me to uh, work at Shepherd Pratt because I am trained as a community psychiatrist. Uh, we had basically two locations, the Towson Hospital and our uh, and our program uh, in uh, in Baltimore County that had a few locations. Um, our 
our payer mix was 90% private insurance, 10% Medicare. At that time, we took no Medicaid. Uh, and about 91% of our revenue was inpatient revenue. Um, now, uh, let's go to 2015. Um, our average stay at Shepherd Pratt now is uh, eight days, down from 80 days. We had 1,000 admissions in 86. Last year, we had 10,000 admissions uh, to two hospital locations uh, in, uh, in Maryland, uh, basically the same number of beds that we had in 1986. There's a lot of story in terms of what happened in between, but that's the uh, inpatient. But the real story is that last year, we treated nearly 70,000 individuals across the state, only 10,000 of whom were ever in the hospital. We have 38 locations. We are the largest provider of behavioral health services in Maryland and the largest not-for-profit provider, independent not-for-profit uh, for provider in the country. Uh, we take care of people wherever they live, wherever they work, uh, and if they need to be in the hospital, it's for a short stay. Even though we have some highly specialized programs that have a little bit longer stay, it's still all about stabilizing them in crisis and then moving them out into day programs, outpatient programs, and community programs. Now, there are two basic policies that uh, determine this change over time. Uh, uh, Henry Harbin can tell the story from his point of view, because he came to us from Green Spring Mental Health Services at that time, doing utilization review, utilization management uh, in the early 90s, and uh, had a tremendous impact on length of stay. Our length of stay, uh, in 1992, when I became president, uh, uh, went from uh, 60 days, it was already, already going down, to 20 days within six months. And we were emptying out like a hotel going out of business. Um, and, uh, but we uh, got together, and, you know, and I'm being a community psychiatrist, uh, said, you know, maybe we need to transform ourselves. And we reinvented ourselves basically as a community mental health center, as a health, we even changed our name. The Shepherd Enoch Pratt Hospital became the Shepherd Pratt Health System. And we decided that uh, counterintuitively we would expand and we developed these community services all across the state, uh, mostly through affiliation with uh, a, a, a very good uh, not-for-profit psychosocial rehab and housing programs uh, and uh, through our special education uh, efforts uh, for kids. Uh, the kids who had been in the hospital now are going to be uh, seen and treated in day schools uh, uh, across the state. We now operate 14 day schools uh, uh, in Maryland. Uh, interesting that I, when you talked about the, the only right to health uh, in uh, uh, healthcare in this country is the jails. One might say the VA also should have a right to health care, but uh, there isn't a right to health care uh, in the United States, but there is a right to education. Uh, kids have a right to education and special education. And so our special education schools are real, really models of what can be done to uh, help uh, severely emotionally disturbed kids and kids with autism up to age 18. You know, once they hit eight, uh, uh, 18, they can fall off a cliff, but, that, uh, but that's another story. The Affordable Care Act also has had a uh, major uh, impact on us. Uh, it kind of expanded the uh, our uh, uh, going to Medicaid and to the public sector. Uh, Shepherd Pratt is very much a private, but also a public entity. Um, now 80% of our funds are uh, public dollars. Uh, only 40% of our budget is actually inpatient uh, uh, care, so it's mostly outpatient care. And the Affordable Care Act decreased our uncompensated care burden by more than a half, in, in, uh, beginning in January of uh, uh, 2014. Uh, a very, very big impact. Um, part of the Affordable Care Act was a demonstration on the IMD exclusion, uh, which is a relic of the 1960s, and that helped expand that. Uh, that money ran out in, on June 30th, and so we have a big problem in terms of uh, Medicaid reimbursement uh, uh, for uh, Shepherd Pratt, the largest provider, and two other IMDs in the state going forward. Uh, the policy issues that are now obstacles, true obstacles, for us to continue to develop a population-based system that could uh, have uh, 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 elements of prevention, working on homelessness, and the incarcerated mentally ill are as follows. First, um, as 
as a number of you in the audience know, I'm an advocate for assisted outpatient treatment or outpatient commitment. We do not have that in Maryland. We're now one of four states that does not have that. Uh, there are a small number, but a very noticeable number of individuals who are continuously readmitted to the hospital because they don't think they're sick, they don't believe they're sick. Uh, they, uh, they go out and they stop their medications, they stop coming for treatment, uh, and they recycle in the system. Uh, we need to have some kind of assistance in engaging them in the system beyond uh, uh, what we have uh, at present, but it also engages the system, as was, uh, uh, as uh, uh, Hank Stedman says, because what it does, outpatient uh, uh, commitment, is it makes sure that the outpatient systems, our systems and other systems, really go after uh, the uh, uh, the patients in a much more engaging way to make sure that they stay in care. Uh, if they don't stay in care, they end up in jail. Uh, and uh, they end up uh, homeless, uh, and that is a, a great public health tragedy. So assisted outpatient treatment, I think, is an obstacle for us to truly develop a much more compassionate and effective health system. Um, with uh, A second problem is uh, a HIPAA and the confidentiality issues and sharing with families essential information. Uh, and the third, a third problem is the IMD restriction, which should go away. Uh, and, there's, uh, and there are efforts uh, to, uh, to make that go away. Um, I do want to uh, uh, mention uh, Representative Tim Murphy's legislation, H.R. 2646, the Helping Families and Mental Health Crisis Act, which is going to have hearings soon. Uh, very important act. Uh, Representative Murphy, you should excuse the uh, expression, is a Republican. Uh, he, uh, he is also a psychologist uh, and has uh, put together a very interesting and very important piece of legislation that, that I think uh, should, uh, you know, could really make a very big difference in terms of these uh, current obstacles that I just mentioned. And then a final obstacle that I, that I want to talk about, which is, which is um, I think, on the horizon to perhaps Will be addressed, and that is the way we survive as a uh, as a uh, hospital and uh, health system is through fee for service, and it's time that we migrated away from fee for service because we're driven by those incentives to something that is much more uh, involved with uh, uh, prospective payment, uh, putting together the right mix of services, housing. Uh, employment, other kinds of non-medical services to help uh, uh, individuals with serious and persistent mental illness. So uh, th that's uh, my com my comments for today, and uh, I really do appreciate this opportunity. So ha we have about five minutes. There's a final um, there's a final exam in this room in. 10 minutes, and so you can feel the tension coming through the walls. So um, just a couple minutes for some quick questions at the microphone. Yes, please. Five minutes. Yes, great. <laughs> Three minutes. Any quick comments or questions for our panel? God, do you hear them? That's terrible. OK. So if we don't have any questions, I'm going to welcome um, Congressman Waxman up for uh, a final word. And then we'll have a couple of questions. Well, this was a terrific panel. And I you know we all very much appreciated the presentations. Uh, we want to know whether people are getting care. We want to know whether. Uh, Serving in a jail is the outpost of our health system. And I remember the days that Sharsty talked about when this Congressman Bill Dannemeyer asked him those ridiculous questions. <laughs> I uh, sat next to him for a number of years, and, that, and those were not as ridiculous as the other questions he asked. <laughs> and I'm not competent to give a, a medical judgment on his mental health, but he was bizarre. <laughs> But I think that we have to look at the fact that people need access to care, that if, they, if they're going to get access to care and follow and stay with it, we need to look at the overall needs of those people, uh, not just the segmentation in different places, but look at them in terms of homes and jobs and rehabilitation. And with those uh, points that I got, 
I got from the presentations and many others uh, as well uh, have a much better understanding of uh, what this problem is and how we can make sure that we, we meet the, our obligations uh, to people with mental health and, and uh, drug addiction. I thank the panel so much for your presentation. Thank you.